Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 79th weekly meeting of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to begin um, with a few quotes just to get things going. And I have had uh, some problems uh, with the sound synchronization with the video. So if you are experiencing an issue with sound synchronization uh, on the video, I hope that you will let me know. I'm going to, uh, from time to time, clap my hands as a way to uh, sync up the video in uh, if I edit the video afterward. So here comes the first clap. Okay, so that's uh, when I do that, it allows me to get a visual cue of when my hands are going together and also see the uh, spike on the, um, on the audio portion. So, uh, here we go. Now we're going to begin. Um, by the way, I've uh, left the uh, yin-yang symbol on the screen just now, just to start to set the tone of uh, marriage as a psychological relationship. Uh, but here are a few interesting quotes which I found in the last week. Uh, this evening for these quotes, I'm reading from uh, C.G. Jung, Psychological Reflections. Uh, this is a terrific book. It's, um, it's, 300 and almost 400 pages long, and it, it's edited quotes by Yolanda Jacobi and R.F.C. Hall. One of the difficulties with Dr. Young's oeuvre is that uh, he said things all through his oeuvre for a period of nearly 60 years, and so pulling the ones together that have commonality or a common topic uh, was quite a task for the people that were in the second uh, part of his, um, the, the second generation apostles. And uh, for you YouTube folks, I'm also broadcasting on um, Periscope, and I've had a lot of viewers on Periscope so uh, that's worked out well. So what I'm going to do, uh, just to while we wait for some uh, of our followers to get going. Hi, Dan. Uh, welcome. Hi, Miles. Um, I'm glad it sounds good to you right now. It may only be coming up on the uh, video afterward. I'm not too sure. Uh, but, uh, Dan, I'm uh, especially putting up the... Uh, Yin Yang symbol in your honor because we're, we'll be talking about that a little later when we talk about marriage as a psychological relationship. But while we uh, wait for a few more people to join us, um, I'm going to go ahead and read a, read a few of these quotes and I'll let you know where they are. Uh, and um, this is the book that I'm reading from. And this is just a terrific book to have by your bedside because uh, it has both short and long quotes, and so it's something that you can read before bedtime. And so uh, this quote comes from a, a um, essay called uh, On the Re-Education of the Germans. This is immediately post-war and it appears in volume 18 of the collected works, and here's the quote. Childlike faith, when it comes naturally, is certainly a charisma, but when joyful faith and childlike trust are instilled by religious education, they are no charisma but a gift of the ambiguous gods, because they can be manipulated only too easily and with greater effect by other saviors as well. Um, imagine who the other saviors are. I, this is uh, from a section of this book entitled The Individual and the Community. Okay, 
Uh, the next quote is from uh, the foreword that Dr. Jung wrote to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and it's carried in Collected Works 11. Quote, our blight is ideologies. They are the long-expected antichrist. Now, as you probably know, uh, Dr. Jung always referred to any ism as the wretched, the wretched ism, uh, because he thought that they were not good and healthy for humanity. Um, next quote. And this comes from a forward to a paper written by Cornelia Brunner um, for um, uh, Jung's Institute in Zurich. It's now carried in Collected Work 18, uh, which is entitled uh, The Symbolic Life. Uh, so here's the quote. What is the use of technological improvements when mankind must still tremble before those infantile tyrants, ridiculous yet terrible, in the style of Hitler? Figures like these owe their power only to the frightening immaturity of the man of today and to his, barbar and to his barbarous unconsciousness. Truly, we can no longer afford to underestimate the importance of the psychic factor in world affairs. And one more, which is going to lead me into a longish quote from um, Mysterium Conjunctionis, is this one. Uh, this is from paragraph 783 of Mysterium Conjunctionis, which is volume 14 of the collected works. The wise man who is not heeded is counted a fool, and the fool who proclaims the general folly first and loudest passes for a prophet and furor. And sometimes it is luckily the other way around as well, or else mankind would long since have perished of stupidity. I think I'll leave it at that for those quotes, uh, but now I thought that I would um, take this a little bit farther. Um, this, um, this rather weighty tome is Mysterium Conjunctionis, and this was the last major work that Dr. Jung uh, wrote in his lifetime. Uh, we're having a thunderstorm outside, so if, uh, if I lose power, I will attempt to get the, the, uh, stream back up as soon as possible, but you never know. We did lose power the other night. Um, okay, so I'm in a Mysterium Conjunctionis, and I'm going to start in paragraph 781. Um, and he's talking about... Um, He's talking about the transcendent world, the metaphysical world. Um, and uh, he says, and I'm starting right in the middle of a paragraph because uh, it gets too long otherwise. It seems to me advisable under these circumstances and in view of the limitations of human knowledge to assume from the start that our metaphysical concepts are simply anthropomorphic. Image, are simply anthropomorphic images and opinions which express transcendental facts either not at all or only in a very hypothetical manner. Indeed, we know already from the physical world, world around us that in itself it does not necessarily agree in the least with the world as we perceive it. The physical world and the perceptual world are two very different things. Knowing this, we have no encouragement whatever to think that our metaphysical picture of the world corresponds to the transcendental reality. Moreover, the statements made about the latter are so boundlessly varied that with the best of intentions, we cannot know who is right. 
the denominational religions recognize this long ago, and in consequence, each of them claims that it is the only true one, and on top of this, that it is not merely a human truth, but the truth directly inspired and revealed by God. Every theologian speaks simply of God, by which he intends it to be understood that his God is the God. But one speaks of the paradoxical God of the Old Testament, another of the incarnate God of love, a third of the God who has a heavenly bride, and so on, and each criticizes the other but never himself. Nothing provides a better demonstration of the extreme uncertainty of metaphysical assertions than their diversity, but it would be completely wrong to assume that they are altogether worthless. For in the end, it has to be explained why such assertions are made at all. There must be some reason for this. Somehow, men feel impelled to make transcendental statements. Why this should be so is a matter of dispute. We only know that in genuine cases, it is not a question of arbitrary inventions, but of involuntary, numinous experiences, which happen to a man and provide the basis for religious assertions and convictions. Therefore, at the source of the great confession, therefore, at the source of the great confessional religions, as well as many smaller mystical movements, we find individual historical per personalities whose lives were distinguished by numinous experiences. Numerous investigations of such experiences have convinced me that previously unconscious contents then break through into consciousness and overwhelm it in the same way as do the invasions of the unconscious in pathological cases accessible to psychiatric observation. Even Jesus, according to Mark 3, 21, appeared to his fo followers in that light. Uh, and I'll just read the footnote here. Uh, the footnote is Mark 3.21. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, he is beside himself. The significant difference, however, between merely pathological cases and inspired personalities is that sooner or later the latter find an extensive following and can therefore transmit their effect down the centuries. The fact that the long-lasting effect exerted by the founders of the great religions is due quite as much to their overwhelming spiritual personality, their exemplary life, and their ethical self-commitment does not affect the present discussion. Personality is, is only one root of success, and there were and always will be genuine religious personalities to whom success is denied. One, only, one has only to think of Meister Eckhart. But if they do not meet with success, this only proves that the truth they utter hits on a consensus of opinion, that they are talking of something that is in the air and is spoken from the heart. I'm sorry, it's not not. I will read it again. But if they do meet with success, this only proves that the truth they utter hits on a consensus of opinion, that they are talking of something that is, quote, in the air, unquote, and is, quote, spoken from the heart, unquote, for their followers too. This, as we know to our cost, applies to good and evil alike, to the true as well as the untrue. You know, here comes the quote that I read earlier. This is paragraph 783. The wise man who is not heeded is counted a fool, and the fool who proclaims the general folly first and loudest passes for a prophet and furor. And sometimes it is luckily the other way around as well, or else mankind would long since have perished of stupidity. Paragraph 784. The insane person whose distinguishing mark is his mental sterility 
expresses no truth, not only because he is not a personality, but because he meets with no consensus of opinion. But anyone who does has to that extent expressed the truth. In metaphysical matters, what is authoritative is true. Hence, metaphysical assertions are invariably bound up with an unusually strong claim to recognition and authority, because authority is for them the only possible proof of their truth, and by this proof they stand or fall. All metaphysical claims in this respect inevitably beg the question, as is obvious to any responsible person in the case of the proofs of God. The claim to authority is naturally not in itself sufficient to establish a metaphysical truth. Its authority must also be backed by the equally vehement, excuse me, its authority must also be backed by the equally vehement need of the multitude, as this need always arises from a condition of distress. Any attempt at explanation will have to examine the psychic situation of those who allow themselves to be convinced by a metaphysical assertion. It will then turn out that the statements of the inspired personality have made conscious just those images and ideas which compensate the general psychic distress. These images and ideas were not thought up or invented by the inspired personality, but happened to him as experiences and he became, as it were, their willing or unwilling victim. A will transcending his consciousness seized hold of him, which he was quite unable to resist. Naturally enough, he feels this overwhelming power as divine. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop in the middle of paragraph 785, but uh, you get the gist of it. Uh, one of the things that... Dr. Jung was saying was that uh, one of the reasons that uh, Christianity was so successful is that Christ hit upon um, something that was in the air and archetypally within everyone. And so, um, so that covers my opener. Uh, and so... Um, if everybody has good sound, good, and I hope we're uh, still in, in good sync. I'm going to clap my hands once again. I'll be doing this uh, throughout these videos in the, for, in the future because uh, I was trying to fix last week's session. Last week's session was actually terrible on the video, and I was having a tar terrible time syncing it up by lip reading myself. I'm not a very good lip reader. Uh, so I'm going to clap my hands again now. Okay. Okay. All right. So now we're going to go on uh, with uh, women in Europe. And um, I'll just go back and very briefly uh, turn this this way. You can see me and my notes. <laughs> um, great, I appreciate that, Dan. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to very quickly go through this because um, Dan Paul asked me to do the marriage as a psychological relationship last week, and I had read this essay long ago, and when I came back to it to try to prepare for this, I realized that I could probably easily do a full semester course only on this essay. There is so much in it, and, and almost every sentence is meaningful. So um, the best I can do is um, try, to, try to skip through the the mountaintops and interest you in going back and taking a look at it yourself. Um, so, but anyway, uh, last week we began to talk about women in Europe, and that video didn't 
turn out so well. So it's on the end of last week's session, but uh, unfortunately it's not well synced. You can listen to it uh, if you want to, um, but don't try it. You'll get dizzy if you try to watch the video while you're listening to it. Um, so anyway, I'm just going to quickly review the uh, paragraphs that we covered last week. So paragraph 263, the institution of marriage is such a valuable thing, both socially and morally, religious people even regard it as a sacrament. No one lives in the world as we desire it. Now, one of the elements of this um, essay is that it was done immediately after World War I. Um, many millions of men, especially uh, the combatants in World War I, were killed. So uh, basically an entire generation was more than decimated. Uh, decimation was a, a Roman army trick where they would kill every tenth man, man just for fun, um, but in, uh, or for discipline, I guess. Um, but in, um, uh, in Central Europe, in Germany, France, um, and to a lesser extent in Switzerland, but uh, certainly in uh, England as well, uh, a whole generation was gone. And so uh, women and men faced a terrific problem in society. And so Dr. Jung is addressing that issue uh, because there were definitely not enough women for, uh, I'm sorry, there were not enough men for the women. And uh, you can imagine a counterpart situation now in China because in China um, they had a one baby policy for many years. And the result was that if uh, a girl was born, very frequently the family would just abort the fetus or, or um, just kill the infant so that uh, they could try again to have a boy because it was so important to have a boy. And so now in uh, China, there is a terrific problem with young men not having uh, women available because so, so many women uh, lost their lives because of this, um, I can say, stupid attitude of the Chinese government. Um, but anyway, all right. So in um, paragraph 264, the important uh, quote is, nothing is gained if a valuable ideal is merely destroyed and not replaced by something better. Okay, so here too, Dr. Jung is talking about uh, marriage and the ideal of marriage. And um, it's quite obvious that um, lots of women uh, in the inner war years uh, were having children out of wedlock and even in the early years after World War II, that was probably true in, in Europe. It was not so, so true in the United States, of course. Um, so paragraph 265, a respectable person is one who comes up to public expect, expectations, who wears an ideal mask, in short, is a fraud. Good form is not a fraud, but when respectability represses the psyche, the God-given essence of man, man, then one becomes what Christ called a whited sepulcher. And um, I'll leave it to you to work out what he was driving at there. Okay. In paragraph 266, now this is the paragraph that has always interested me uh, because of the quote here. First of all, uh, love is beyond the law. Uh, that's the first quote. But then, but who has fully realized that history is not contained in thick books, but lives in our very blood? Um, <clears throat> and you can imagine 
<clears throat> what he was trying to say by that. Um, and Miles says, I always come back to Jordan Peterson's statement that men are inclined to things and ideas while women are relationships and aesthetics are men <clears throat> typically the ideologues that Jung doesn't like. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's fair. Um, and um, <clears throat> I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Um, and because uh, this essay ends with uh, a significant quote that addresses the Jordan Peterson issues as well. Um, so let us go on now. Um, so when what he's referring to in paragraph 267 is the full weight of historical inertia. So in other words, notwithstanding the fact that there was this crisis in society with so few men available to marry women, uh, women were faced with this um, quandary, uh, this expectation that they would be perfectly behaved little housewives and so on in talking about Central Europe in the first half of the 20th century. And, um, and Dr. Young is saying that, you know, that's not going to be possible. I mean, this was, he was writing in 1927, and he was trying to address a reality, a psychological reality. And um, <clears throat> in paragraph 268, uh, he says, mere continuation can be left to animals, but inauguration is the prerogative of man. So what he's saying is, uh, yeah, okay, we can get all these women pregnant and create a new generation, but maybe we ought to rethink the idea of marriage. I think that's what uh, he was trying to say in a backhanded way. Unfortunately, um, because of the time he was living in and in the post-Victorian era, um, he didn't feel free to speak as, as um, clearly as he might have. And I think that probably everyone that's watching us right now has a pretty good idea of what Dr. Young's own personal life was like. Uh, he certainly had a number of um, love affairs during his life. If, uh, if you haven't seen it, I urge you to watch the movie A Dangerous Method, which actually covers a period 20 years earlier than the time that this is being written, but it uh, covers the relationship between uh, Dr. Jung and um, Dr. Freud and Sabine Spielrein, and it's a, a very interesting study, and I would urge you to take a look at it. Um, so moving on, paragraph 269, a longing for meaning and fulfillment, a growing disgust with senseless one-sidedness, with unconscious instinctuality and blind contingency. Um, so the women were uh, looking for meaning and fulfillment, and um, they were pretty turned off by the way the men had handled uh, society and the war, um, and killing off so many millions of men. And um, then he has this quote in, in paragraph 269. Women are increasingly aware that love alone can give them full stature, just as men are beginning to divine that only the spirit can give life its highest meaning. Both seek a psychic relationship because love needs the spirit and the spirit love for its completion. And uh, so I might just uh, for, for grins here, um, reintroduce this for a moment. Um, 
the issue about marriage is that um, the marriage partner brings something to you that you do not have and um, some psychic wholeness let's say and that wholeness is always spinning i mean you'd have to imagine uh, the yin yang symbol as always rotating in one way or the other and uh, changing slowly um, as it does so and so this is the issue of uh, marriage in general um, and it's also the issue uh, with respect to the this point about uh, love and spirit and so uh, in paragraph 270 he says that humanity needs to build a psychic bridge in other words uh, the point about marriage is that um, it creates a bridge between the opposites and allows you to have more experience and we'll talk about that a little later in the marriage essay but uh, it allows you to have fulfillment psychologically okay paragraph 271 uh, if you say someone is human you're talking about just a low average and dr young was uh, not very impressed by statistics and the ideas idea of averages the the so-called average man um, because um, you know um, statistics lie <laughs> very simply um, and um, so anyway um, he also says in this paragraph, no man can be redeemed from a sin he has not committed. Um, and so I think that's a very interesting backhanded way, perhaps, of saying that uh, maybe you need some experience with sin, whether you're a man or a woman. And I would... Um, urge upon you um, among other things this translator's note in the marriage essay which i wanted to read anyway but i let me just um, read it here let's see because i i've tried to translate for people um and uh, from English to English, believe it or not. Um, I had occasion to be asked to uh, do a translation into English of a novel by my uh, Turkish novelist friend, Meltem Arikan, and it already had been translated by a Turkish doctor. And so I was only translating it from Turkish English into English, American English, and I found that I had tremendous difficulties because then I had to decide whether uh, Meltem, as the author, wanted to sound more European or more Turkish or just sound like an American, and and each of those things are. Um, I don't know, levels or something. And so it makes it very difficult. And R.F.C. Hall, who spent at least 40 years translating Dr. Jung's work from German into English, did a tremendous job of it. Uh, but he, he makes this comment. This is in the marriage essay, but it relates to this essay as well. In translating this and the following passages, I have, for the sake of clarity, assumed that the container is the man and the contained the woman. This assumption is due entirely to the exigencies of English grammar and is not implied in the German text. 
Needless to say, the situation could just as easily be reversed. Okay, and so the reason I mention that now is because um, even though Dr. Jung used the term man and um, no man can be redeemed from a sin he has not committed, it could as easily be a woman. Okay, and so um, the. Okay, we're up to paragraph 272. Um, all right, so Dr. Jung makes the caveat, this is not for the young, but for the more mature man whose consciousness has been widened by experience of life. It is the privilege and task of maturer people who have passed the meridian of life to create culture. And so... I think what he's saying is that, uh, okay, we can let our children imagine a, an ideal, but when the situation isn't ideal, then mature people have to make other decisions in terms of how, um, how they're going to live and how uh, things will be. Uh, certainly, uh, I've seen huge, huge changes in my life in the United States. I was in the, I joked that my college class was the last class of the Victorian era. And uh, as a result, um, I was uh, one year too early for the sexual revolution. <laughs> and when we get into the marriage is a psychological relationship. Um, I will readily admit that one of the reasons I wanted to get married before I went to Vietnam was I wanted to have an experience of being with a woman, especially being with a woman sexually, uh, before I potentially put my life on the line in Vietnam. Uh, that's not necessarily a good reason to get married, but nonetheless, there it is. That's a truth. Um, and so, anyway, uh, let's see what else we got. Grace says, men can be logos-driven and not eros-driven. Absolutely, that's what we're getting to in paragraph 275. So, and Miles says, yes, journalism professor Robert Jensen points out that we men neither menstruate, gestate, or lactate probably explains a lot about just don't get it when trying to understand women. Um, women are a mystery. There's no doubt about that for men. And um, we, we need to have them in our lives for a variety of reasons, but um, they need to cue us in on their mystery from time to time. Okay, so paragraph 273. Woman, unconsciously as ever, sets about healing the inner wounds, and for this she needs, as her most important instrument, a psychic relationship. But nothing hampers this more than the exclusiveness of the medieval marriage, for it makes relationship altogether superfluous. Morality presupposes freedom. For this reason, the unconscious tendency of woman aims at loosening the marriage structure. Oh, I'm going to correct that on the fly, uh, but not at the destruction of marriage and family. That would be not only immoral, but a thoroughly pathological misuse of her powers. And so, uh, certainly Dr. Jung experienced that in his lifetime. Uh, he lived in an open menage a trois uh, with uh, Tony Wolf, and um, Tony was accepted by Emma Young in their family and came to dinner every uh, Sunday at the Young home for 30 years or so. And so um, uh, that would be a, lo a loosening of the marriage structure but understanding that uh, Tony could uh, do something for Dr. Jung that she, 
Emma could not do. And uh, Emma is quoted as having said um, that she will always be grateful to Tony for getting Dr. Jung through the very turbulent time of his visioning process during World War I uh, because um, he was having, uh, I don't think he ever had a psychotic breakdown per se. I mean, as a psychiatrist, he knew what was going on, and I don't think he ever really um, let loose from it. And I've had a similar experience, as some of you know, and so I don't feel that I was ever in danger of psychosis per se, but I certainly was under the spin of my unconscious of my anima for some uh, months, for eight months, when I wrote my novel. And so, um, so anyway, Tony held Dr. Jung together, and she was actually his analyst. And uh, for that reason, I think, uh, Dr. Jung was very adamant that every Jungian analyst had to have an analyst. Um, and uh, because you need to keep a grip on reality. Okay, so paragraph 274, it is the way of woman as of nature to work indirectly without naming her dole. Uh, well, I mean, that may be true. I sometimes uh, work indirectly. Um, certainly as I work on this, my Carl Jung project, I consider myself working uh, indirectly on uh, social politics in the United States. And I'm not um, directly criticizing anyone, but, uh, at, but you know, yeah, some may think so, I suppose. <laughs> and and uh, it's fairly indirect to be talking about Dr. Jung's mysterious oeuvre uh, and having that have a, excuse me, having that have an influence on what's happening in the world. And um, what I can say is the things that I have done um, have had a huge impact on the world. Um, and uh, some of you have heard some of these stories. I'm not going to go into it at length tonight because I want to get into this marriage as a psychological relationship. But, um, you know, very subtle things uh, can have a huge political influence on the world. And so, um, finally, in paragraph 275, Dr. Jung says, the indirect method of woman is dangerous for it can hopelessly compromise her aim. Today, religion leads back to the Middle Ages, back to the soul-destroying unrelatedness from which came all the fearful barbarities of war. Um, and then here, this is the key paragraph or quote here. It is the function of Eros to unite what Logos has sundered. The woman of today is faced with a tremendous cultural task. Perhaps it will be the dawn of a new era. Well, I would say, um, you know, this essay was written fairly early in Dr. Jung's writing, and I think that later on he might say that um, it's the feminine principle uh, which is, is faced with this tremendous cultural task uh, because I regard uh, the performance and presentation of these meetings as a feminine activity. It's, a, it's an activity of relatedness. And assuredly, um, I have no doubt about my manhood. I served a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Marine Corps, and um, 
so there there's no issue there i have three daughters and nine grandchildren among other things uh, but i do see my feminine side uh emerging and it has been emerging for quite some time um various ways as you'll see uh, in the next segment of this evening and um so i think it's uh the ro role of all all of us from an eros point of view to start pointing out that logos uh in the end logos doesn't get you anywhere in the end logos is is dead it's just a bunch of words and until you put life into your life and experience life's experience and this is one thing that dr Jung emphasizes in the next essay um then you're not unless you've had those experiences you're not going to be able to affect any changes and so um obviously the my communication with all of you is an eros style of event it is um it's about relatedness it's not about slicing and dicing there are no precisely perfectly right answers here you know certainly i uh, played with a lot of perfectly right answers uh, when I was in the Marines and certainly a, as a practicing attorney and um, in many ways while I was building my business career. But also I always considered my business colleagues as part of my family. I considered it a family, uh, not just uh, disposable uh, units and so I would be on the opposite extreme from um, you know who <laughs> in terms of how I run a business and it worked quite well for me over a long period of time um, so anyway so yeah gray says bring on Aquarius yeah I, I think we're there gray and Miles being summoned by she who must be obeyed. Yeah, that's uh, you. You must certainly obey that. Uh, wow. Okay, so I'm going to stop with a woman in Europe unless there are particular questions about that. Uh, so Dan says so. This YouTube channel allows you to integrate your anima. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's uh, an accurate statement. Um, it certainly allows me to integrate my feminine, uh, the feminine principle as it exists in me, whether that's anima or not, that's, that's a little bit of a different issue. Um, because anima is uh, soul, it is... Um, you know, for men, it's an animating principle, but uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that one. I'm go I'm gonna um, beg off answering that precisely. I mean, I think, as I say, I think it's uh, integrating uh, my feminine side in the yin yang uh, point of view, in the sense that all of us have both a masculine and a fem feminine side. I'm not quite comfortable with the idea that it's anima per se, but we can continue to discuss that. That's an open discussion. Um, so now I am going to take women in Europe off the screen. Uh, you will find it in, um, in the Dropbox if you're a member of our Dropbox. And if you're not, you can write an email to skip.conover skip at gmail.com with your regular email address, which I need for Dropbox, and I will add you to our Dropbox, where you can pick up things like sets of these notes, which are very useful if you ever want to teach a course on Jungian psychology. <laughs> 
So few people do. Okay, so I'm going to <clears throat> uh, do my clapper one more time here uh, as uh, oh, this flashing for er everyone. It's flashing on my screen. Let me see if I can stop that for a second. Um, I don't seem to be flashing, but that connection to my word seems to be flashing for some reason. Maybe it's roll now. Okay, so I'm going to give you my clapper once, one more time for audio sync for this next segment of this meeting. And um, we're going to go on with Marriage as a Psychological Relationship, originally written in 1925 by Dr. Jung, and it's um, paragraphs 324 to 345 of the Development of the Personality, volume 17 of the Collected Works of C.G. Jung by Princeton University Press. Okay, so, um, so one of the things that Dr. Jung often does, and I find it rather frustrating, is that he cops out on giving you a full discussion. And even though he's fairly critical about the scientific method where um, you hold everything constant except for X, uh, and, um, but he does the same thing. And so particularly in this essay, and this essay is just incredibly complex. I mean, even, um, one paragraph goes on for like two and a half or three pages. And so what I'm doing is, uh, in order to be able to get through it at all in one or possibly two evenings, we'll have to see how it goes in terms of your comments, because I'd love to hear your comments about this. But um, in order to get through it at all in one or two evenings, uh, I had to uh, sort of cherry pick some of the key ideas in each paragraph. And um, so uh, starting with paragraph uh, 324, he's going to disregard the legal and social issues of marriage. Well, <laughs> <laughs> in what kind of world does that work? <laughs> That's only, only in a fantasy world of a psychologist, I think. I mean, obviously, there are huge legal and social issues <laughs> uh, involved in marriage. And, um, and so um, we have to go on with him. And uh, what, what I would say is that uh, this essay is not the best essay that he ever wrote. It may be a function of it being uh, relatively early in his uh, important work. And so it, um, it doesn't, it certainly doesn't see marriage quite as I would know marriage or even have been taught about marriage as I was growing up in the 50s and 60s. Um, and so I'm presenting these ideas as just ideas for discussion, but I'm going to also embellish it with some of the perceptions that I've come up with over a lifetime of experience and being married twice and uh, once for 17 years and once for um, now uh, 32 years. I've been with my current wife, and so um, so anyway, um, we we can share some war stories if you want about marriage per se, <laughs> uh, and someone on Periscope is asking me to please message him, uh, or I think you need to send me an email to skip.conover at gmail.com and we can communicate. A little hard to 
do it through these videos. But anyway, um, all right. Um, so the point is, paragraph 324 is going to hold all the other variables constant except for the psychological issues. So uh, fine. And in 325, he says that it, the assumption is that both parties are conscious and, um, and are only unconscious to a limited extent, because if you're not conscious, um, you can't have a relationship. Um, and so then he goes into discussing this a little bit and the emergence of consciousness in paragraph 326 He's talking about how, as a child, uh, your consciousness arises from the depths and you become more and more aware of things and your consciousness extends. Uh, typically, he refers to the fact that you gain consciousness only through pain. And so as long as everything's going on and, and mommy's just putting food on the table every day and everything is hunky-dory, everything is fine, uh, then you're not going to also have any consciousness about the way the world is, and no maturity about how to make decisions in the world that we actually live in. And so what he, his uh, metaphor for this is that as a child, your consciousness starts to emerge as as separate islands and it's always ego consciousness and um, only gradually do you start to distinguish yourself from others and uh, your consciousness is incomplete and it's <clears throat> uh, it, it's absent of relationship now dan says um, so paragraph 325 is an assumption good i am finding trying to understand the dynamics of the Jungian model of the psyche, difficult to grasp. Any references that would allow me to understand it? Uh, Dan, I think that uh, it would be very useful for you to go through uh, the first part of uh, ION. Um, <clears throat> and I've already read that into the YouTube channel, so you can find it there. Um, and uh, so I'm talking about the first four chapters of the book, plus all the uh, commentary of Edward Edinger, which I've interspersed with the actual uh, chapters of the book. Um, and uh, there's probably about eight to ten hours worth of listening, but I've actually read the two books, both... Um, Dr. Young's book, the first I read through about half of chapter five, but the, the structure and dynamics of the psyche is mainly covered in uh, the first four chapters. And it, um, we can talk about it again at the end. I don't want to lose steam <clears throat> right now, but Dr. Edinger, uh, gives uh, a very good uh, diagram of the structure of the psyche uh, there. And if you uh, read those first four chapters, plus Edinger's comments on the first four chapters, you'll really get a pretty good idea of the basic structure of what Dr. Jung is talking about. And um, I'm, as I now have discovered that and gone back through other things that I've read long ago, I realized that, that Edinger is quite right. And it's pretty easy in Jungian psychology to get lost in the weeds, I have to admit. Um, and so, I mean, I probably was reading Jung for 15 years uh, before things started to connect to me, for me. It was like the separate islands that he was talking about. But once I read uh, Dr. Edinger's commentary on those first four chapters of Ion, I really started to get it. And um, the other reality, of course, is an answer to Job and understanding that Dr. Jung 
regarded uh, Job's experiences as visions and the Red Book, which he did not allow to be published in his lifetime, um, was also his own experiences, very similar to the experiences of Job. And so understanding all these things um, and understanding their context in the world um, as he was facing it uh, helps quite a lot. Um, so anyway, uh, Grace, uh, Grace says, depends on what you want to, where you want to go. If it's the psychology, start with modern man in search of a soul um, and symbols of transformation. Um, yeah, also uh, man and his symbols is a good place to start for a layman. Um, and the religious, it's religious thoughts, it's answer to Job in the Red Book. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, and also Ion. Um, Ion's very important for that. And also um, Dr. Edinger's book, The Ion Lectures, which is his lectures about the about Ion. Um, and uh, you know, the other thing is we're reading Answer to Job. That's our Thursday project. But... Uh, is Edinger's book, uh, Transformation of the God Image. And he actually had another book uh, called um, Archetype of the Apocalypse, which also is relevant because um, the third <laughs> answer to Job is about uh, Revelation, about the book of Revelation. Uh, so... Uh, Thank you, Gray. I appreciate that. Yeah, Ion is scary, but, um, and, and very honestly, I was, um, I, w I bounced off of it uh, several times. I mean, uh, Dr. Peterson um, once in a lecture commented that, you know, people just bounce off Jung because his writing is so difficult. And this essay that we're talking about now is an example of that. Um, but, um, but I found that if, if you can read it side by side with, with, uh, Dr. Edinger's, uh, lectures, it helps immensely, immensely. And so I urge you to do that, not to just read uh, Ion straight on, but also read the um the cliff notes that dr edinger provided it's very very helpful okay all right so moving on um so paragraph 327 um dr young says girls are more ego conscious they uh, but they have a broad area in the shadows and Many of their motives are unconscious. This is true of men, too, obviously. And um, everyone uh, overestimates consciousness in every part of life. Obviously, when I was uh, 10 years old, I remember thinking, wow, I'm, I'm me and I know everything because I'm conscious. And uh, it's really... Uh, quite astounding to realize what you're not conscious of. And um, even as I've gone forward in my life and recently in the last decade, um, I've become conscious about things and about how things really work in the world of um, Wall Street and big business uh, that certainly I was not conscious of. And uh, and about um, how our court system works, which if I had known then what I know today about the American judiciary, uh, I would not have served to defend the Constitution of the United States because in my personal experience, uh, my rights have not been uh, 
honor in the state of Maryland all the way through the Court of Appeals. And um, the U.S. Supreme Court has allowed them to get away with it. And if I had known that my rights would be so badly trampled, uh, I would uh, probably not have sworn an oath to the Constitution that has, from my perspective today, uh, it's almost meaningless. And so we have to put meaning back into it. Um, so anyway, uh, so girls also um, have a fatal compulsion. Okay? Obviously, uh, men and women both do. Uh, they have unconscious motivations. In 328, we're talking about the unconscious motivations people have. Um, and uh, they're both personal and general. They're, and obviously, what I'm skipping over fairly quickly here is the parental influences and relationships and the bond with the parents. Dr. Jung went into these issues at some length, although he does it more so in other places. But, um, but, uh, I'm just mentioning them here in a Jungian style because <laughs> that's what Dr. Jung would do. I don't want to get into all that complicated stuff <laughs> about parents and <laughs> what your father or your mother did to you or didn't do to you or whatever it is. Um, I, I saw a t-shirt on Facebook today. I was left unsupervised. <laughs> um, but I did want to address one thing. Um, but anyway, there's a there's an unconscious tie to the parents and parents sometimes meddle. And obviously in countries where there is arranged marriage, um, you know, in my experience, arranged marriages work just as well as love marriages, if not better in some respects, because the people that are making the decisions about who you marry are more conscious and they know how things are going to play out later on in your life. And so um, I know a lot of people who had arranged marriages and are very successful with those. Um, now, another piece of it is a compensation for unlived lives of parents, and I would say also grandparents. Um, in my case, I um, was always fairly derisive of both my maternal and paternal uh, grandfathers. I, I sort of considered my paternal grandfather uh, kind of Willie Lohman in the Eugene O'Neill sort of way. and. Um, my maternal grandfather, I just considered a knucklehead bigot, uh, and he and I just didn't get along at all. He lived in my household for eight years. But um, now I realize that I'm living a compensation of their unlived lives in the sense that um, my grandfather lost his business and his home after the 1929 crash, economic crash, and in many ways I'm living a compensation of his life now. Um, and uh, I'm not going to get into that in more detail tonight, but I will do at some point. And in the case of my a grandfather, I, my maternal grandfather, um, he was born almost the same time as Dr. Young. He was only six years younger than Dr. Young. And um, so he was a man of the late 19th century. And he had the prejudices that were common in those times. And so, yes, my life um, is a compensation for their 
and live lives and the things they couldn't do. And the same for my father, right? My father, um, you know, got hooked on cigarettes when he was in the Navy. He served as a Naval officer for 27 years. Um, but he, and it wasn't that he died early. He smoked for 60 years. He died when he was 83. Um, and so he had a good long life, but the last 15 years of his life, he was on a oxygen bottle and, um, you know, things that he couldn't do, I am now being drawn to do. So, um, so anyway, uh, the worst results come when the parents are playing on you unconsciously. It's at least I'm conscious of these things, and you can think for, about yourself in terms of whether you're conscious about your the impact of your parents. Um, and another issue is whether uh, your instincts have been played through in your marriage. Uh, in other words, Dr. Jung favored um, selecting a spouse instinctually as much as possible, but that's largely not possible in our um, our societies today. And there, you know, are various obstacles and organic and psychic factors combined to interfere and. Um, so going on to um, paragraph 329 here. Okay, so here's where he says it. He says, in terms of maintaining the species, the instinct is best. In terms of picking the best spouse for your, for, for your children, um, going by your instinct is best. Uh, in personal re liaison if unconscious, which is how, what happens in primitive societies. And um, that gets regulated by traditional customs and prejudices, which he defined as conventional marriage today. So obviously we have many traditional customs and prejudices, and um, we have to learn um, how we can live beyond the strictures of those things in a mature and adult way, um, which means that you might have secrets. Dr. Young was uh, talked about secrets as being numinous and that it's, it's useful to have a secret. Um, and certainly there are cer certain things that might go on in a marriage that would best be kept secret. Um, what I would observe is that, you know, we often get a lot of this hoo-ha about various politicians who are having love affairs and so on. Well, it's not only politicians, obviously. And, um, you know, I don't know what percentage of love affairs never get found out, but I imagine there's quite a number. And so, um, okay, so now I want to talk to you about uh, unconscious identity, and that's this paragraph 330, um, and the idea of rebus. Um, and rebus is not discussed in this essay, but it is um, an idea in uh, marital psychology that, that has become more apparent um, in Dr. Jung's later work, certainly in uh, alchemy. And so there, there's two words, rebus, that are pronounced the same way. There's R-E-B-I-S, which is the one we're talking about, and the other is um, R-E-B-U-S. So a rebus in the R-E-B-U-S sense is a sentence that um, 
has pictures instead of words in some places. So um, you say, I drove the car to school, and you typed out, I drove the, and then you put a picture of a car uh, to, and then you put a picture of a school building. That's a rebus, and we see those occasionally in cartoon pages and newspapers and that sort of thing. Um, And um, so, but anyway, I want to read to you the definition of rebus for this purpose. Uh, the rebus is the end product of the alchemical magnum opus, or great work. Uh, after one has gone through the stages of put putrefaction and purification, separating opposing qualities, those qualities are united once more in what is sometimes described as the di divine hermaphrodite, a reconciliation of spirit and matter, being of both male and female qualities as indicated by the male and female head within a single body. Uh, the sun and moon correspond to the male and female halves, just as King Red and uh, Red King and White Queen are similarly associated. And so it presupposes uh, a similar structure in marriage. And what I would say is that, uh, and I think I'm going to get to it in a minute, but um, as you have a close relationship with someone, anyone, um, there are certain things that pass between you and the other person, which only you know. Um, sometimes it's an intentional secret, sometimes it's something that has passed unconsciously, and uh, you were, the two of you are aware of it, but no one else is aware of it. And um, in, in Billy, uh, Billy Joel's song, um, And So It Goes, uh, there's, there's a chorus that says, and you're the only one who knows. And so after you've had a, any sort of relationship with someone else, um, there will be some things that only the two of you know that others don't. Uh, for example, um, there are some people in this chat stream, for example, uh, who I've interacted with, and, um, and only we know uh, what we have discussed privately, but the same goes on constantly in a marriage, and um, and so you develop a rebus which uh, gradually becomes stronger and stronger. One hopes, and where you you face difficulties in your marriage, um, you can often call upon. Uh, those difficulties. Now, uh, we haven't gotten down to the this issue of the contained and the container, and that's very relevant to Billy Joel's song, so I'm, go I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, but anyway, within a marriage, obviously, you have, uh, you have sex, and so you have the feeling of unity and identity, one heart, one soul, um, unconscious oneness, is a return to childhood and the womb. It's a return to this sacred space of the family. And, and so as you build that relationship between the two of you, uh, whether you've married as a love marriage or an arranged marriage, um, this rebus does build up and it begins uh, almost immediately. Uh, in fact, it, it certainly begins when you first start to get to know one, one another. And uh, as Dr. Young says, it's a genuine and incontestable uh, experience of the divine. And um, this trend, so this is an, an early marriage now we're talking about here. The tr there's a transcendent force that obliterates and consumes everything uh, individual, and you begin, begin to operate as a couple. And 
unfortunately, the reality is that this too will change, and, and it changes when you get to um, this very often when you get to the second half of life. But um, in some cases here, you may have reached um, a point where your individuation begins uh, in earnest, and that's when uh, that's when you have to be able to uh, develop a mature relationship, and um, and so anyway, Dr. Young says that during this early phase, though, uh, both instruments both are instruments of the life urge. Mother Nature is imperious, so. Mother Nature wants a reproduction of the species, and um, and so you may not be conscious of other things, but one thing you are conscious of is you're probably going to reproduce, and um, and Mother Nature is pretty emphatic about that. And um, what Dr. Jung observed in paragraph three thirty one then is that the psychological link uh, is essentially collective and it's not yet an individual relationship per se. Um, there's, and, and here we get into this, there's no birth of consciousness without pain. So um, you gradually start to come into impasses with one another and um, those are painful, and it raises uh, it raises consciousness issues, and um, so um, three thirty one is this very long three part paragraph uh, where three thirty one a is talking about ways of conscious realization, and in the second half of life. Um, the child is in a magic circle of the family, and um, you achieve in the first half of life the uh, scope of your personal power and possessions, and um, your own life overgrows the limits of the marriage then, and it starts as a passion, it develops into a duty, and finally it uh, reaches being a burden, which is uh, sucks the life out of you, and um, this maybe this explains the popularity of vampire stat sagas. I don't know. That's uh, it might be archetypal. Um, so it takes your whole strength and will, and this occurs uh, as soon as you begin your second half of life. And um, Dr. Jung claims that you start developing conservative tendencies uh, if all goes well. Um, you start to seek out your real motivations and your individuation begins. Real discoveries are made, but only through the severest shocks. And certainly I've had quite severe shocks in my lifetime, and, and um, you know, not the least of them has been the shock that, that the legal system in my state uh, doesn't defend my constitutional rights. That's, that's a severe shock. To me. Um, and, um, but in terms of the conservative tendencies, yeah, I'm not sh so sure. I mean, I went to, a, uh, but I, yeah, I guess so. It's, it's just that I'm the opposite of it. So, um, you know, when, when I joined the Marines, uh, most of my classmates, I went to, uh, what we tongue in cheek call a little lefty college in upstate New York, Hamilton College. And when I was at Hamilton, uh, most of my classmates, and there were 180 men, I was the last class that was all men uh, at Hamilton. I went co-ed essentially after that. Uh, 
um, most of the men did not serve in, um, in the military. I think only 16 of my classmates of 180, so fewer than 10% actually served. And I literally had to fight my way through a cordon of uh, football players to get to the recruiting table at, uh, at uh, the college uh, when I joined. And yet those guys who were so uh, left wing, I'm not sure that's a fair de description of them, but uh, most outsiders would call it left wing. Um, today they are extremely conservative whereas I would have been regarded at the time as very conservative joining the U.S. Marines in the middle of the Vietnam War and uh, voluntarily I might add um, and um, and I'm probably the most liberal or one of the two most liberal <laughs> members of my class <laughs> uh, today. So I don't know if I was conservative then. I don't feel like my positions have changed a lot. But anyway. Um, so paragraph 331B, there's... Um, strength and inner resolve is sapped and that you start to have discontent you and oftentimes that gets projected on a partner and it may not be at the same time but it it's a something that happens and it may depend on the relationship to your parents and how they handled things and um so it's something that you need to be conscious of in terms of your marriage because um, you're, you know, lots of marriages do fail in midlife and they're mainly because the thing that held you together, the children have flown the coop and now the two parties don't have that same uh, goal anymore. And so then it's... Uh, important throughout a marriage to uh, talk about these things and work them out. Uh, and so paragraph 331c is talking about differences in tempo and spiritual development. Uh, there's an issue of a certain complexity of mind. One party normally will have a more complex mind, like, like a gem with many fa facets. And The adaptation to simple personality is always a problem. And uh, the partner, the simple partner, if there is one, uh, can lose themselves in the labyrinth. And I can say uh, without equivocation that this certainly happened with me in my first marriage. And in fact, my ex wife at one point said to me, you're a big person, Skip, and what she meant was that I had many interests that were beyond merely uh, cutting the grass and, and so on. And so, anyway, there's, um, there is a, a good psychological discussion of marriage in Khalil Gibran's um, 1923 book, The Prophet. And as a matter of fact, um, this part of this book, um, let's see, do I have it here? Here's the book, The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. And um, if you haven't read it, I urge you to read it. It's not a Muslim tome by any means. I read it first when I was probably a senior in high school. And um, my current wife and I uh, selected this passage uh, to be read at our wedding, and it was part of our wedding vows. And so I'm going to read it to you here, and I urge you to not only follow along, but also, um, but also uh, read the rest of the book. So, uh, Here's what Khalil Gibran says on marriage. 
The Almira spoke again and said, And what of marriage, Master? And he answered, saying, You were born together, and together you shall be forevermore. I, ye shall, you shall be together even in the silent memory of God. But let there be space in your togetherness. Let the winds of heaven dance between you. Love one another, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. Fill each other's cup, but drink not from one's cup. Give one another of your bread, but eat not from the same loaf. Sing and dance together and be joyous, but let each one of you be alone. Even as the strings of a lute are alone, though they quiver with the same music. Give your hearts, but not into each other's keeping, but only the hand of life can contain your heart, for only the hand of life can contain your heart. And stand together, yet not too near together, for the pillars of the temple stand apart, and the oak tree and the cypress grow not in each other's shadow. And so that's a pretty profound, and obviously it touches a, a deep, deep complex in me uh, that I've been aware of for practically my whole life, at least 50 years. Um, uh, important enough that my wife and I included it in our wedding vows. And um, Dr. Young felt that the best marriages were marriages where uh, each of the partners uh, attended to their own individuation. Um, and, and so certainly that is the relationship that he had with Emma Young. And uh, there, I think anybody that ever met them felt that they were a very strong couple. And I've heard other comments that said that Emma Young was the most individuated person they ever met. And, um, you know, obviously that relates very, in a very complex way to um, their lifelong relationship together. Dr. Young met Emma when she was 14, and when he saw her, Coming down the stairs of her parents' home, he said to himself, she will be my wife. And so they had a very, very, very strong relationship. And um, the only ones who knew. So now we come to this issue of the container and the contained, and I'm only up to page uh, five of 11 pages in this <laughs> article, but I will try to get going on uh, the container and the contained. Um, and so, um, so paragraph 332, the contained. So the idea is that there's one person that has many facets and one person that has fewer, and the many faceted one is the container, and the fewer facets is the contained. And so the container um, can't get all the needs of the many facets fulfilled within the relationship. So the container tends to seek um, tends to seek counterpoise to those facets outside the marriage, whereas the simpler person, the person with fewer facets, um, doesn't feel the need to look outside. And so uh, the contained, in paragraph 332 now, the contained is entirely within the confines of the marriage. The attitude is undivided. Personality cannot be entirely seen. It's not 
altogether credible or dependable. And um, the advantage of it is that it is undivided. So it's all focused in one place. The container, um, and here's where the translator's note that I read earlier comes in, um, where uh, Mr. Hall was talking about the fact that, that the pronouns mean nothing in terms of the translation between German um, English and that it didn't really have the the he and she aspects that in German that it had to have in English in order for him to translate it. So um, so anyway, there's the the need to unify the, for the container. There there's the need to unify and to unify all the facets. Okay, so the container is seeking subtleties and complexities uh, to complement and correspond with uh, his own complexities, and um, this disturbs the the others, the contained simplicity. So any mental effort invariably prefers the simple. Uh, the simple nature works on more complex, like a room too small, and it, there's not enough space within the marriage to fulfill all the needs. And um, the container feels outside the marriage because um, they're looking for something else. And so there's a this is a problem role. The more contained clings, the more the contained clings, the more the container feels shut out. And it tends to, the, so the container t tends to spy out the window unconsciously at first, looking for unity and undividedness, uh, seeking completion, seeking contentedness and undividedness, which is always lacking. And so I remind you of the yin yang symbol that I showed at the beginning of the session. Um, so for the contained, it's a confirmation of the insecurity uh, felt that in the rooms there are unwished guests or guests because, um, as I mentioned, my first wife said that you're a really big person, Skip. Well, she was. In, in this space that was just too big for her and she couldn't, she was knocking around in there. There were guests that she didn't quite approve of, whether they were unconscious or conscious is not the topic for this discussion. But anyway, uh, it drives her in on herself. And so it makes it possible maybe to find security, but now I want to refer to this Billy Joel song and um, keep in mind that Billy Joel was married to Christy Brinkley, who was a very famous supermodel. And um, when they were breaking up, uh, Billy Joel wrote this song. And um, I'm, um, I'm going to ask you at the end of this, which of these parties was the contained and which the container. So uh, Billy Joel says, and this is very much along Jung's lines, in every heart there is a room, a sanctuary, safe and strong, to heal the wounds of lovers past until a new one comes along. And uh, then it goes on for several more verses, and then it closes with these words. So I would choose to be with you. That's if the choice were mine to make. But you can make decisions too, and you can have this heart to break. And so it goes, and so it goes, and you're the only one who knows. So um, are there votes here on the chat about whether who is the container and who the contained uh, in this particular marriage? Anybody have a comment on that? <clears throat> so anyway, um, I'm just noting here that uh, 
this last line, and you're the only one who knows, is the rebus that we discussed earlier, that uh, when you have a relationship, a marriage relationship, um, as between the two of you, you have things that nobody else can share and no one else has shared. Um, uh, okay, so anyway, um, my view, uh, which I guess was up on the screen all the time, so it wasn't really a question, is I, my view is that Billy Joel was probably the contained in this relationship and that Christy Brinkley, many opportunities uh, outside the marriage, she was traveling around doing you know, her international supermodel gigs and so on. And you know, Billy Joel was, uh, or is, uh, probably an introverted songwriter. And, and so he was, he was the contained in, the, in this context of Dr. Young's. And um, so I guess what I would say is that, yes, um, I think that there probably is a, an element of container and contained in most marriages. Um, I think that in my first marriage, I was uh, the container. There's no question about that. In my second marriage, uh, it's likely true that I'm the contained uh, in the sense that you know I'm retired and um, moving into my older years, and and my wife is still uh, employed and going to work every day and working nine to five, and uh, we pretty much revolve our lives around our employment at the moment. So our lives are contained within that context. Uh, that may change, uh, but uh, the reality is that, you know, when I did change uh, partners, um, I was looking for someone who could match my facets, which were extremely complex, as you might guess, taking the trouble to look me up on um, LinkedIn or something like that, you'll start to get a appreciation for it. But um, you know, my second wife uh, is, uh, is a Phi Beta Kappa. She got to do things that I didn't get to do. Uh, for example, when I was a senior in college, I wanted an advanced degree in Asian studies because I had gone to high school in Japan. And um, my wife got to go for an advanced degree in Asian studies at East West Center at the University of Hawaii, uh, which was a program that I very much wanted to do. But instead, I got uh, a year of Chinese language school in the Marine Corps and then uh, nine months of advanced Asian studies in Vietnam, <laughs> which was not quite what I had in mind, but nonetheless, <laughs> that, that was the boys' version of the same thing. So, uh, so anyway, um, there are facets to my wife's life that, that matched facets of mine in many ways. And so, um, anyway, uh, So anyway, um, when the thing breaks down, the the contained uh, might attempt through violent and desperate efforts to force the partner to capitulate. And this definitely happened with me. And with the view of getting the container to admit to ch childish and morbid fantasy. Well, I wasn't going to admit to any such thing because I was, my consciousness had been expanded to the world at large. I had by that time lived overseas for four years of my life and um, I had other things to do and indeed uh, I did do other things. <laughs> I went on to 
um, went on to live a very complicated international life, which is what I had always intended. Um, so if that effort by the contained fails, it may do good because they find security in themselves. They're forced into themselves. And um, they find the complexities uh, of the that the container could not find in themselves. And so, you know, I think that's kind of a rationalization. I, mean, I think if we taught this material and these general ideas a little better in high school and college, I think we would have fewer divorces. That's what I believe. Um, and so let's see, we have 15 more minutes. I'll do my best to keep going. Um, so in paragraph 334, then, Dr. Jung is talking about unfaithfulness. And, um, and what he says is that the dissociation, the, the looking out of the marriage for other facets, uh, isn't healed by being split off. It, it's healed by a complete disintegration, something um, that opens up the possibility of inter inner integration. And so when you have something bad happen to you, when I, I left my first marriage, I was 39 years old and I was unemployed for years it took me two years to find a job and um, this totally I this you know in some ways it psychically destroyed me because here I was a lawyer MBA I had just spent five years in Japan building a company from nothing up to ten million dollars a year and um, I spoke Mandarin Chinese and Japanese and I couldn't find a job in Washington DC it was just bizarre. Um, and so I really had to go into uh, myself, into my uh, introversion. But uh, fortunately, I was already an introvert because I grew up in the Navy. And so my family moved every year or two. I went to 11 schools before I finished high school. And so um, the result of what happens when that happens, and the same thing happened to my wife, except that she was, uh, she grew up as a junior in the YMCA, where her father was a YMCA director. Um, and um, you become uh, introverted and you learn to live from um, your inner self instead of looking for encouragement outside. Um, but anyway, in paragraph 335, then, Dr. Young is talking about um, the fact that at this midlife crisis point, there's a transformation that takes place for both. And you turn from being a tool of instinctive nature. In other words, instead of being forced into being a parent and having children and raising children, uh, now you turn to yourself. And uh, it's, so it's a transformation from nature to culture. And it's a transformation from instinct into spirit. And so that's an that's a in, interesting idea that I think folks should reflect upon is what is meant by that transformation from instinct into spirit. Um, I know a lot of men have, um, well, I say peccadillos early in life, and uh, maybe they have them throughout life, I don't know. But uh, obviously that's instinct, um, which is driving that. But gradually one changes into some sort of spiritual side. I don't mean by that religious, and I don't think Dr. Jung meant by that religious, but it meant that you, f you found um, 
you found the counterparts, the split aparts to your uh, the parts of you that weren't achieved yet. And obviously, by midlife, you you know, if you're forty or so, you've you've already raised your children, and or pretty nearly by forty-five, certainly. Uh, and you know, then you have to figure out what you're going to do for the rest of your life, and it's not going to be that um, because your children are going to go on and live their lives now. And so, in paragraph uh, three thirty-six, then. Um, Note, any attempt to create a spiritual attitude by splitting off and suppressing the instincts is a falsification. So, in other words, um, you can't just stop the in instinct. Um, and so, um, Jung's comment was that a furtively purient sp spirituality is just as bad as gross sensuality. Filled with the furtively. Um, and the transformation takes a long time, and a lot of us get stuck in that. And um, then he talks about primitives. The, the, they are the fully matured products of an undisturbed fate. But, and then he asks this question what European, and we could say American too, is not deformed by acts of moral violence. In other words, um, somehow uh, you've been forced to do something that wasn't what you wanted to do, one way or another. And so by acts of moral violence, I think this is something that might happen in the confessional in the Czech Catholic Church or something like that. And um, where the where the priest says that you have to do X, Y, or Z to make up for whatever your sin was that week. Um, so he says we are still barbarian enough to believe in asceticism and its opposite, libertinism, and um, we have to find a middle way. I mean, this is the the message here. It's uh, have to find a way between the opposite. And uh, we can't go back. We must strive for an attitude of living out our fate as much as possible. Only then, not turning spirituality into sensuality. Uh, we have to live both. Both must live, each drawing from the other. So uh, we need sensuality and we need spirituality. And the question is, how do you have that live that opposite, which is an individuation issue, of course. Um, and, you know, sometimes it may be by having secrets. Who knows? Um, yes. Um, so, anyway, it says I may stop at this after this paragraph and not get into anything. Let me stop out after 337. Uh, this above is the essence of the psycho psychological marriage structure. Okay, so this is what Dr. Jung says, taking out Billy Joel and Khalil Gibran, uh, is the psychological marriage structure. And uh, there, are there are illusions to serve the ends of nature, uh, and there's much to say. I mean, he says, Jung says in this paragraph 337, there's much to say about the ends of nature. And um, you know, obviously, that's the case. And um, I guess we can all use our imagination on this. Um, but, you know, I'm commenting again, this is a cop-out because he didn't discuss what the ends of nature are or what the things were to say. <laughs> and um, so there's a peculiar harmony in the first half of life provided by adjustments. Uh, and this is because of our archetypal projection. In other words, uh, the unconscious is, has an archetypal 
projection, you're playing house. And obviously this begins with, um, you know, little girls and little boys uh, when they're five years old. They're, they start playing house and the, those archetypes start to operate at that time. And those archetypes work through and play through the first half of life. And they have primordial origin and it's the imprint of the archetype coming through and it's an inherited system of psychic adaptation like motherhood and once a woman is a mother that's it you're a mother for the rest of your life and that archetype is going to play through and um, the role in motherhood um, may change but nonetheless uh, it's going to play through through so basically what he's saying is that in the first half of life in the in the childbearing, child rearing stage of marriage, um, these are elective things that are happening to you and they're archetypal. And then you get to the end of that string, you play through that record, and you know it's pretty much over. And for mothers, it have the empty nest syndrome. And then the question is, what next? Okay, so there's more to say here, but I have um, four minutes left on my two hours. And so I'm going to go to questions and I will finish up from paragraph 338 um, next week. And uh, I'll certainly accept any other suggestions for things to discuss next week. But um, I wanted to. Uh, I hope that this is sort of sufficient, Dan, for what you were hoping to get through here. Dan asks, what are acts of moral violence? Um, well, um, uh, you tell the priest that you masturbated this week, and the priest uh, says you have to say and Hail Marys or whatever it is. and so, um, you know, the masturbation was an instinctual thing, and um, the priest is putting a moral, um, morally violent twist on that to try to make you stop doing that. Uh, that may not be the healthiest. I mean, that's, that's a pretty gross example, but that's what comes to mind. Um, um, let's see what other acts of moral violence um, well um, things like being forced to go to church when you when you feel nothing about church um, you have to find your spiritual self somewhere it's not necessarily in the four corners of a church building and um you know i i have on separate occasions talked about um three religious experiences that i could remember having in the context of a church building only one of them involved a church service the other two uh, were events that occurred to me privately when I was sitting in a church, uh, but they didn't, they weren't because of a service or because of uh, Christianity per se. Um, and so, you know, I, like Dr. Jung, I have no need to believe, I know. Uh, I think Gray has use that term too so he must know and others might may know um and you know the the beauty of what dr jung's oeuvre did in the latter part of his life was he told us where god is and at least the god image quote unquote and and you know whether whether that's the metaphysical God, um, I'm not going to say like Dr. Jung. Last summer I said rather arrogantly, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't have to 
I don't have to toe the mark, and I'm not a theologist, so I don't have to toe the mark. But, you know, in fairness, he said we can't tell the difference between the metaphysical God and God image, and the God image uh, can be demonstrated empirically by psychologists and psychiatrists. And so I know that experience of God. And so, unfortunately for Friedrich Nietzsche, he didn't. And so for him, uh, God was dead. But for me, God is not. And I think that Dr. Jung found the living God. Um, we need all to learn from that if, if we want to uh, save our species. But that's my homily for, the, for tonight. Um, Dan, I'm, I'm glad to hear <laughs> that's been helpful. I, you know, we have, to, um, we have to reflect on all these things. And I think the fact that, you know, you're still here um, after two hours and after a number of these, um, you know, suggests that you are a reflective person. And um, so... Uh, if we're mature enough, our marriages can survive for 50 or 60 years. Um, but I think that Gibran's answer is the best one. Uh, and, uh, and I especially um, point your attention to, um, to the point, um, and the oak tree and the cypress grow not in their shadow. And so the um, way to have a long and successful life is for you and your wife to live your lives and share the things that you can share and respect one another about the things that you don't have in common. Respect the need of the other to uh, find some outlet or some match up for that facet of their life or your life uh, outside the marriage, uh, one way or another. If that involves secrets, then it involves secrets. Um, but, you know, I, obviously love affairs can be very corrosive and uh, they can also cause great um, pain um, for a lot of people, and um, we just see you know, the President of the United States twisting in the wind over all of his, you know, I don't think any of us want that, and so the question is, um, how do you find a balance? Um, In terms of psychological balance, uh, Dr. Jung felt very strongly that we need to, quote unquote, live our animal, quote unquote. That is, live the part of ourselves that is an animal. Uh, but then, then what? What, are, what is the balance? Um, anyway, um, Dan, I'm uh, glad it's helped and uh, I'm going to offer some more thoughts uh, next week, and we will continue on Thursday with Answer to Job, where things are hotting up. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you all then. I'm going to shut it off because we're over time, and I'm going to get the beginning of this is going to get cut off if I don't stop. So that's one of the reasons why at the beginning I put the... Uh, quotes on the beginning, so if they get cut off, it's no huge loss. Thank you for being here, and I'll see you next week. Bye.